All right, um, thank you very much and uh, welcome to my presentation. And uh, I'm deeply grateful for your coming and your interest to my uh, presentation today. Okay, so um, today's topic is uh, the collaboration between the School of Geology, Mongolian University of Science and Technology, and with the American universities. Um, so basically, what I'm going to talk is um, the um, the collaboration and educational and research and scientific um, um, work together we've been doing with the American universities. I am um, going to summarize, summarize uh, this today. Um, so the, from our knowing, the very first um, geologist, the scientist who came to Mongolia is Roy Chapman Andrews, is a renowned paleontologist uh, who is actually from the American Museum of Natural History um, in New York, I think. And um, he led, the few, he led few field expeditions to Gobi and uh, discovered uh, fossilized dinosaur remains and also fossilized dinosaur eggs and any other artifacts related to the living organisms uh, from the Jurassic and really all times. Um, so, these people, people are actually the young pioneers that, who, who has been doing the geological research in Mongolia since uh, 1991, since Mongolia shifted to democracy. Um, so, we can name uh, Dr. Peter Molnar from uh, MIT and also U USGS um, researchers like Carol Prentice and also David Schwartz. Um, and also Dan McKenzie uh, is from Cambridge University. Okay, so these folks were originally were uh, seismologists or active tectonics study uh, kind of people. So they had been grown interest on the, they originally have been studying the um, seismicity along the margins of the tectonic boundaries such as as we know, like Japan is most seismically active place on Earth, just recently had a big strong earthquake happen, and also west coast of the United States is one of the really prone to area, and also Chile. And then we know that along the boundaries of tectonics uh, plates, these events would poss really possibly going to happen. Okay, so how, how about for Mongolia? So this is looking like that. A little bit of, in, in a western area, there are a little bit of ac activity goes on. Okay, so Carol Prentice and David Schwartz were actually based in California, the two USGS scientists, and so they've been studying San Andreas Fault um, for uh, many years. And then they had the grown interest um, to Mongolia and then wanted a contact uh, to work in Mongolia and actually, actually, they started working together with uh, Dr. Baiskalan Amgalan, which is sitting here, also my teacher and my advisor. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so Dr. Baiskalan has been working with uh, those scientists uh, since 1991, and uh, he introduced with his academic advisor, Dr. James Jackson from the Cambridge University, and uh, went to Cambridge in probably 1995, I think, and graduated in 1999 and obtained PhD degree uh, with the topic of active tectonics of Western Mongolia. And uh, shortly after graduation and return to Mongolia, he started working in the Mongolian University of Science and Technology at the School of Geology. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Dr. Baiskalan has been studying in Mongolia. So his topic was the tectonic activity in Western Mongolia. So in, in central Mongolia, there is a mountain range called Hangai and also in the West, there is Altai. So, so these 
mountain uplifts and also sort of seismic activities are related, possibly related to the Indian plate, which is pushing north to the Eurasian plate with quite fast accelerated speed, which is the 40 millimeters per year, and uplifting the region, uplifting the Himalayas mountain and creating mountain range and then big sort of orogenic, which is a mountain building process is going on here. And on the other side, the Baikal rift system. Rift means like pulling apart from each other. So Baikal is actually pulling apart from each other at the rate of four millimeter per year. So with the influence of those two tectonic plate uh, activities, the base sort of background of the seismicity of Mongol in Western Mongolia is due to these phenomena. Um, here, seismic activity of Mongolia. Uh, so all those red dots are um, the seismic events happened and also if, if the circles are big, the event how strong the earthquake was. So basically a lot of small earthquakes happen every year and which is one of the two strongest earthquakes has happened in the uh, past century is 1905 Volnai uh, earthquake, which happened in July 9, and with the magnitude of 8.3, which is really strong, it's actually one of the 10 strong earthquakes in the past century. And also in 1957, Gobi Altai Fault, which is in the south, which is shown by the green star, um, uh, happened with the magnitude of 7.5. So based on these things, uh, Dr. Baiskalan deduced that actually the central Mongolian block is rotating clockwise uh, due to the, the transgressional um, long arm of the Himalayan orogeny, which is pushed by the Indian plate to the Eurasian plate and also the um, rifting Baikal system. So the clockwise slow rotation is going here. Okay, so how does the earthquake faults occur, uh, show on the surface? Um, so Gobi Altai Fault is actually uplifted by some 12 to 15 meters. Um, here's the compared to the size of the people. And also on the Bolnai Fault, which is still 100 years past, but still the, the traces are visible on surface, which is a rare, really rare case. Um, so here, a lot of scientists were doing the, uh, the Daga Trench and also the uh, mapping the, um, how the earthquake has happened and also the sort of ship, um, basically mapping and also the, how much movement has happened in the one event or so. I think this is the centennial of the Bolnai Fault in 2005 uh, and um, a lot of scientists from around the globe has gathered here. And uh, okay, I'll talk about our next project. So Dr. Alan Gillespie from uh, University of Washington um, has written a letter to Dr. Baistalan that he has an interest to work in Mongolia. He's a quaternary geologist, which is a sort of new and young in terms of geology, which would be 2.6 million years since the 2.6 million years. So quaternary is actually relatively young compared to the other geological ages. So Dr. Bob Carson is from Whitman College. So those two scientists were actually came for doing project in uh, Darhat depression in uh, Hull School. So Darhat depression is uh, on the uh, um, western part of Hufskull Lake and, and which is re really sort of depressive, like a whole kind of sinkhole form of area, which is full of marshes and bogs and very wet and rainy place. And um, actually it has been proven, okay. So what's interesting from Darhat depression, so the shorelines, shoreline-like features along the hills of the mountains which confirmed that this area was probably once filled by the lake at a certain time and then lake level sort of drops and rises or so and so moraine deposit which is the glacial sort of transport deposits were 
present at the uh, northwest corner of the Daha Depression, which is the river runs out. And also the signs of catastrophic floods due to climate change in the end of last glacial maximum, which is about 13,000 years ago. Um, so the records were sort of proven around this area. So, so the eventual deduction is probably this depression is once filled by the lake at a certain time. And um, so the mollusk and shell remains were abundantly found in this area. So the small sort of shell, the, the organisms living in water. Um, and ice dam location is probably was here and then probably is melted and uh, caused an outburst flood that all the water runs through this drainage and then flew northwards. Um, okay, so this is the Tingis and Shishit, the, the river names, in, on the, near, the, um, near the ice dam, which, which I earlier said. So this is actually, this is actually the very um, upper part of the Yenisei River um, to Russia here. Okay, so the outburst flood was possibly happened through this here. Um, okay, so Dr. Gillespie uh, filled the, using the highest shorelines and then filled the area. And how does the probably, uh, the, the lake would look like? So possibly this and about 70 meters deep lake was present for a certain time. Um, okay, next I'm going to talk about the um, Keck Geology Consortium's students field expeditions, which jointly organized with our university. So this expedition has organized in, um, for six times since 2003 till 2010 in a various di different regions in Mongolia. Um, okay, so history. Keck is a geological consortium with the union of uh, many colleges in the States and also uh, have the foreign relations and organized field expeditions elsewhere. Okay, so um, the idea was originally coined by Dr. Reinhard Vobus in Williams College and it has been distributed since 1987 with, with the support of two fellow faculties and originally established with 10 college members, it has now expanded to 19 colleges. Okay, so here are the the Keck colleges, um, the logos or universities are here. Uh, and it, it, the Keck's goal it, is to provide quality field research internships for undergraduate students. And also it's 20 years past since the first project was launched. And currently 116 projects have completed by the 115 research centers from 50 organizations and then over 970 undergraduate students participated uh, in these expeditions. And also each year the research conference is organized um, for summarizing the projects completed in a certain year and its participants, circles or supporters have already been informed and continue to sponsor graduate studies and then successful projects like more likely to develop to a detailed research project. And uh, Keck Mongolia project, this is the year and also the place names. Um, I would uh, introduce one by one. Here. So, um, so the very first one in Tavanharovo is in Dorngov Amak and Igindava, um, Govaltai, Dilun and various different places. So this is our students doing their field work in their respective years and, in, and their respective geological research. So the photo. And um, okay, introduce briefly one by one at what, what they have been doing. So Tavanharovo is in the very first one that Keck organized in Mongolia. Um, so it has 19 students, but which of 10 are Mongolian, nine are American and six professors was leading and also from this region one interesting thing is Roy Chapman Andrews expedition found fossil remains of mammals, dinosaurs and eggs 
in around 1922 to 1923. And um, some of the scientific findings or the, their research results, so it is proved that the five striking rounded structures were craters caused by meteoric stroke based on their fracture direction and peripheral elevation. And also it's proven that the east northeast directional fault system is active, Holocene, which is the very young one, like since 10,000 years. And an Aeolian origin, so wind originated um, um, sand accumulation it surface is the Tavon Harovo, revealed that the district is westerly wind was predominant, which is from the west, and also the minor change in direction of south and north as the secondary. So the direction was changing, and but so sometimes from north and south. Uh, so the second expedition is Harhira in Ufs, very mountainous area. So Harhira, Tugan, Snow Barren Mountains, and geology of the Anthracit Coal Deposits and Jid Mountain Range. So four faculties and 19 students. Um, so Harhira um, <coughs> deduced that the the positional age of the Har Tarvachtai Coal Valley is 300 million years and new active faults were discovered in the Jid mountain ranges and regional displacement along the fault is approximately one kilometer for last 15,000 years and the maximum length of the glacier in the region is about 20 kilometers. This, the third kek is Hangai, again Dawa. Dawa means pass in, in English. Um, so so the research area is Hungar Range and its vicinity and the research team consists of four faculties of Mongolia and the States and a total of 27 students and 15 are Mongolian, 12 American. And the interest is petrological studies, the rock studies of the, the granite sort of internal structure and texture and the origin and development of the basalt petrology of the southern Hungai and the age and displacement of the Igindava fault system and also the maximum glacial size around the Igindava and its absolute age and then also the permafrost which is very prevalent in the region. And um, so the conclusion from the Hangai project is actually at least two glaciers occurred. Um, um, the last was about 13,000 years ago and also the summer air temperature was seven to nine degrees lower than what it is today. And the basalt flow was at least for 20 million years have been stable. And also for the active fault systems, the last activity has been around 300 to 500 years. And the first was probably around 7,300 and the earthquake was set about 7.3 magnitude, causing a rupture with a total length of 71 kilometers long. So the fourth is the Delun in Bayanulgi, in the far western region where Kazakh people live. Um, so Tolbo Lake fault systems and Huyton Peak Glacier and the moraine deposits in the region. So four faculties and 22 students. And the goal, research goal was the origin and kinematics and displacement rate of the active fault systems and paleoenvironmental and glacial research in Central Asia. And one of the conclusions, it's discovered that the active tectonics, the displacement of the Hochser mountain range, which is part of the Altai mountains, are strongly associated with its glacial processes. And Gobi Altai, 2009, the history, evolution, and paleogeographical study of the Gobi Alta terrain with geologic ages, probably 400, 300 million years ago, and then th three teachers and 12 students. And uh, history, paleogeography of the previously unexplored section that were believed to have originated in the Paleozoic and Mesozoic, which is the geologic ages, probably a little bit unfamiliar to most of you guys. Um, as a result, the certain parts of the geological development history of the area have been identified. And who school? Um, so far the last, um, but we hope that organized more, <laughs> the CAC project uh, happened in Mongolia. So it was on the north shore of the Husko Lake. 
to the Quaternary Active Tectonics, Glacial Research and Climate Change, and attended by eight American and eight Mongolian students with five teachers that led them. And uh, kinematic studies of active faults in host school array, rift valley and their orogeny displacement, and paleo environment, which is the really old environment, and also the paleoclimate studies of the upper Pleistocene about uh, 100,000 years ago in Central Asia. And it's discovered that active faults in the host school rift system have an active horizontal displacement from the upper Pleistocene to the Holocene. Okay, so here are some of the highlight photos from the, all of some of the uh, field expeditions. So, so it's the cultural exchange and scientific um, research and also like camaraderie, very friendly environment that introduced with each other or so. And also it's very um, beneficial to our students. So what are the contributions for the development of students? Okay, so 10 American, one English, and three Mongolian professors led the field expeditions. 57 students from the States and 59 from Mongolia and one from Switzerland, one from Germany have completed the field research. And from the Mongolian students who, who participated, 22 um, went to the States for attending to a symposium in the US with their poster presentations in various different locations. And domestic and foreign cooperation reached to a new level and with the advent of scientific research, the motivation for further studies has been established. And so far from our participants, more than 10 Mongolian students defended PhD degree or currently studying. And more than 20 students of our participants obtained master's degree and all successfully majority of them are successfully working in the governmental organizations, universities, geology and mining companies with foreign investments as well as non-governmental organizations. Okay, so, um, so if I talk about Keck, it was about, it was about that. Um, so the next um, exchange program that actually I have been attended to is the Tahoe Baikal Institute's Summer Environmental Exchange Program, which I first uh, attended in uh, 2004 in the United States and Russia, and also it, it organizes every year since 1991. But in 2010 and 11, they um, included Mongolia, and so they came here and organized their exchange program for about 10 days. And also in 2012, there are alumni exchange at the Desert Research Institute. And uh, where take Lake Tahoe, if some of you who are not familiar with that. So it's in uh, California, in the Sierra Nevada range, and one of the deepest lakes on the world, about 500 meters deep, though relative to its size. And Lake Baikal is in southern Siberia, just north of Mongolia. So they formed uh, an organization uh, to attract young environmental science students or leaders to um, gather and uh, do some research and uh, cultural understanding and exchange. Um, so here are some Mongolia photos that Tao Baikal Institute have been doing here. Um, so established in 1990, TBI is a partnership between Lake Tahoe and Lake Baikal, and it organizes watershed management and environmental exchanges to foster cultural understanding and to develop young environmental leaders. And the, the goal of TBI's flagship program, the Summer Environmental Exchange, is to help develop community leaders, research professionals, and environmental stewards around the world by exposing to them to watershed issues through a place-based interdisciplinary sense at both Lake Tahoe and Lake Baikal. So again, so those are participants in Russia. I think those are in Mongolia. Um, and this is at Lake Tahoe. We were doing throwing a seki disc and um, checking out the clarity of the lake. This is Lake Tahoe, but this is Mongolia in the Euro region in Selenga. So summer environmental exchanges consists of the small group investigative projects, hands-on ecological restoration work, meetings with export experts and policymakers, and interactive workshops that stimulate environmental problem-solving scenarios. 
and uh, it develops the community leaders, the research resource professionals, and also environmental stewards across the intersections of watershed education. And TBI's focus is on protection and restoration, research and policy, sustainable economic development, environmental technology transfer, and cultural understanding. Um, well, so they organized the alumni exchange program, which is the give it an opportunity to come back to either to Russia or to United States or to Mongolia um, um, with, to work at the host organization and um, month-long um, sort of work that fits with their career development goals. So I was lucky to attend to the DR DRI, Desert Research Institute's um, um, part, and also two American students came to Mongolia and a few others went to Russia for the alumni exchange. Um, I want to introduce the National Science Foundation's Hangai project next. So Dr. Carl Webman actually is my advisor at the North Carolina State University and also the Peter Zeidler. Th th these were the principal investigate PIs, principal investigators of the project. And then some of the collaborators from Mongolian side. So this is the Research Center of Astronomy and Geophysics and also the Institute of Geography and Geocology. They were from Mongolia. But from the United States and Canada, there were Dalhousie from Canada, Stanford from the States, and also the University of Baltimore and Academy of Natural Science at Drexel University and a few other universities also attended. So the, the, the grown interest, why Mongolia was interesting, because the enigma of high topography in the continental interiors. Um, so, so we need to understand um, how the mountains develop, which is mostly along the active tectonic uh, boundaries, as we know, like such as places like Japan or California or Chile. But uh, for Mongolia, it's different. Um, so this is the tectonic boundary map. Uh, Hangai Mountains is here, Hangai Mountain Project. Right. So, um, so the plate tectonic boundaries have active, active margins, which is just like the west coast of the states, or passive margins, just like east coast of the states, which is no longer active, but still sort of, it is considered that the Appalachian Mountain in the east coast is actually active only about 10 million years ago. Um, so the scientific motivation of the Hangai, so high elevation, low, low relief regions are common and despite being distant from the active plate boundaries. And these continental plateaus influence river networks, climate, and migration of flora and fauna over geologic time scales. And origin and longevity of continental plateaus remain a first order question in continental dynamics. An estimated timing of the uplift of the mountains is important for constraining the geodynamic process models. So Hangai is Occupy Road upland embedded in the Greater Mongolian Plateau, and it's 1.5 to 2 kilometers above the regional base level and contains high elevation, low relief, and 30 million years record of intermittent basalt volcanism and also positioned between the large active intercontinental stratigraphic faults that produced magnitude 8 earthquakes during the last 100 years and timing of compressional transpressional fault initiation is associated with the collision of India to Asia, and it actually the power decreases towards the north, let's say. So Hangai Mountain is in central Mongolia, it looks like, like this, so the active faults like Gobi Altai here and by the edges, and then as I said, it's deduced that the rotating clockwise slowly so the, the goal, the research goal of the Hangai project was actually the timing of regional eradication from stable isotopes in the soil calcium carbonate and molecular genetics of fish, geomorphic metrics of drainage divide, mobility versus stability, paleotopography and erosion rates, basalt vesicle and paleotopography, and uh, comparing deep earth and deep time results. 
Um, here's uh, my, one of my chapters. Um, the results come from one of my research chapters, so polyclimate reconstruction based on chemical weathering. So in the Hangai Mountains, these polysols, which is, which is the old sols, are kept by the basalt flows with the age of 11 to 3 million years. And during the late Miocene to Pliocene, which is the 15 million to 3 million, the mean annual temperature was about 5 to 10 degrees warmer than what it is today. Um, and this result is consistent with the long-term paleo temperature proxy trends from Lake Baikal as well as the global marine records. Okay, so these are the ages that the how many million years ago on the uh, geological stage, so 12 to about 3 million years, and then this is the global record of how the temperature was dropping gradually uh, since uh, Okay, so this is, this is covering actually 60 million years, but the, the red oval, this part is from like 10 million. So quick, pretty sharp drop here. Um, so which is, I'd say this is consistent. Well, this covers the 60 million years, the gradual sort of decline of the uh, mean annual temperature. Um, so the next project is the Hamunga, uh, no, sorry. Harvard University project uh, led by uh, Dr. Francis McDonald and Dr. Oyang, which is the, our Mongolian graduate of the Harvard University. So her topic and their study was the co-evolution of Proterozoic cratonic fragments in the western northern Mongolia. So what they have been doing is, um, so the new Proterozoic area, which I also showed the geologic time scale here, which, which is one of the oldest times, which about 20, no, Proterozoic, no, no, Phanerozoic is, no, the, yes, Proterozoic is covering from 25,000, um, no, 2,500 million years, actually, 2.5 billion years to 541 million years, so which is Barely the single-celled organisms will start, start sort of originating or the multi-celled organism at the very earliest stage. So the Snowbell Earth theory is actually sort of coined by this scientist, Joy Kirschwink. So what, why Snowbell has happened on Earth? Because it's due to grown um, activities of the volcanism around the world. So if so earth interior forces were once very active and then started like a lot of volcanoes were rafting over the world and then at that time it will create a lot of like gray clouds which cover the whole atmosphere of the earth and also and then this will lead to sort of block the sun light and then radiation balance and it just sort of um, it, a dramatic change in the radiation balance and eventually it starts cooling down and then it creates eventually snowball earth so covered by fully by snow i think you pro some of you probably have seen from the documentaries of the national geographic or so um so um so dr oyanga and also mcdonald what they do is sort of try to match the all all those old cratons by its margins uh, based on the biological sp species, mul really first ones of the multi-celled organisms and also ma matched by the rock types and also the ages, which is based on the stable isotopes. Um, if you want to hear more, you can contact Dr. Oyendo later. Um, University of Washington, um, Dr. Alan Gillespie actually also took one student from Mongolia, Dr. Batwater. Um, um, he's been doing quaternary geology and glaciology research in the Altai Mountains. Um, and from Montana State University, um, Dr. David Vericio um, advised Dr. Badam Hatam, who is a paleontologist um, at the Bozeman, Montana. And then he's he came back to Mongolia and now working at the uh, paleontology uh, center. Uh, uh, from our master's students, Dr. Kerry Johnson um, advised uh, Solomon, our Fulbright wardy, 
and uh, Solomon's topic was paleo biochemistry of fauna fossils in southwestern Mongolia, and also uh, Dr. Kelty Thomas from uh, California State University at Long Beach. He advised uh, Bayamuk, one of also our Fulbright Wardy. Um, so his topic is the dynamics of Olung Ovot in South Mongolia gold deposit area and fault and fault systems. And also Elizabeth Hawley from Colorado School of Mines. Um, she advised Solomon, who is Oyutalwa Awardi, uh, fellowship awardee, and then his topic was exploration and economic geology. And uh, Dr. Baiskalan himself attended to, uh, he awarded the Hubert Humphrey Fellowship uh, from 2007 to 2008 and attended to the University of Pennsylvania uh, with the topic of uh, natural resources management too. And uh, we are proud to have four PhDs and three masters from seven American universities. And also we have numerous, many number of PhDs and masters from Australia, Europe, Japan, China, and elsewhere. And um, upcoming projects, um, Dr. Ryan Leary from New Mexico Tech shown his interest to come back to, the, to Mongolia and doing some research in the Altai Mountains in Mongolia. And it's in the stage of applying and uh, or so. And ACMS Field School is going to happen in uh, 2020. And uh, I will be leading one of the projects there. And thank you very much for your, your attention. Um, and. Uh, <laughs>